Hi everyone. Today we're going to be reading the story to Dado in memoriam. And we're going to read the story and then we're going to get in a discussion of some of the narrative techniques, some of the themes, um, a brief summary of the story. And we're also going to be looking at the conflict in the story. Oh, Nana, all of you is not involved in this evil business, death, nor all of us in life. From At My Grandmother's Grave by Liebert Bethune. To Dado in Memoriam, Paul Marshall. I did not see her at first, I remember. For not only was it dark inside the crowded disembarkation shed, in spite of the daylight flooding in from outside, but standing there waiting for her with my mother and sister, I was still somewhat blinded from the sheen of tropical sunlight on the water of the bay, which we had just crossed in the landing boat, leaving behind us the ship that had brought us from New York, lying in the offing. Besides being only nine years of age at the time and knowing nothing of the islands, I was busy attending to the alien sights and sounds of Barbados the unfamiliar smells. I did not see her, but I was alerted to her approach by my mother's hand, which suddenly tightened around mine. And looking up, I traced her gaze through the gloom in the shed until I finally made out the small, purposeful, painfully erect figure of the old woman headed our way. Her face was drowned in the shadow of an ugly rolled, br rolled brim brown felt hat. But the details of her slight body and of the struggle taking place within it were clear enough. An intense, unrelenting struggle between her back, which was beginning to bend ever so slightly under the weight of her 80 odd years, and the rest of her, which sought to deny those years and hold that back straight keep it in line. Moving swiftly towards us, so swiftly it seemed she did not intend stopping when she reached she reached us, but would sweep past us out of the door of the doorway which opened onto the sea and like Christ walk upon the water. She was caught between the sunlight at the end of the building and the darkness inside. And for a moment she appeared to contain them both. The light in the long, severe, old-fashioned white dress she wore, which brought the sense of a past that was still alive in our, into our bustling present and in the snatch of white at her eye. The darkness in her black high-top shoes and in her face, which was visible now that she was closer. It was as stark and fleshless as the death mask that face. The maggots might have already done their work, leaving only the framework of bone beneath the ruined skin and deep wells at the temple and jaw. But her eyes were alive, unnervingly, for one so old, with a sharp light that flicked out of the dim, clouded depths like a lizard's tongue to snap up all in her view. Those eyes betrayed a child's curiosity about the world, and I wondered vaguely seeing them and seeing the way the bodies of her ancient dress had collapsed in on her flat chest. What had happened to her breasts? Whether she might not be some kind of child at the same time that she was a woman, with 14 children, my mother included, to prove it. Perhaps she was both, both child and woman. Darkness and light, past and present, life and death. All the opposites contained and reconciled in her. My dadu, my mother said formally and stepped forward. The name sounded like thunder fading slowly in the distance. Child, Dado said, and her tone, her quick scrutiny of my mother, the brief embrace in which they appeared to shy from each other rather than touch, 
wiped out the 15 years my mother had been away and restored the old relationship. My mother, who was such a formidable figure in my eyes, had suddenly, with a word, been reduced to my status. Yes, God is good, Dad said with a nod that was like a tick. He has spared me to see my child again. We were led forward then, apologetically, because not only did Dadu prefer boys, but she also liked her grandchildren to be white, that is, fair-skinned. And we had, I was to discover, a number of cousins, the outside children of white estate managers and the like, who qualified. We, though, were as black as she. My sister, being the oldest, was presented first. This one takes after the father, my mother said, and waited to be reproved. Frowning, Dado tilted my sister's face toward the light, but her frown soon gave way to a grudging smile for my sister with her large, mild eyes and little broad winged nose with her father's high-cheeked Barbadian cast to her face was pretty. She is going to be lucky, Dad said and patted her once on the cheek. Any girl child that takes after the father does be lucky. She turned then to me. But oddly enough, she did not touch me. Instead, leaning close, she peered hard at me and then quickly drew back. I thought I saw her hand start up as though to shield her eyes. It was almost as if she saw not only me, a thin, truculent child who did, who it was said, took after no one but myself, but something in me which for some reason she found disturbing, even threatening. We looked silently at each other for a long time, there in the noisy shed, our gaze locked. She was the first to look away. But Audrey, she said to my mother, with, and, her, and her laugh was cracked, thin, apprehensive. Where did you get this one here with the fierce look? We don't know where she came out of, my dado, my mother said, laughing also. Even I smiled to myself. After all, I had won the encounter. Dado had recognized my small strength. And this was all I ever asked of adults in my life then. Come, soul, Dado said and took my hand. You must be one of those New York terrors you hear so much about. She led us, me at her side, and my sister and mother behind, out of the shed into the sunlight that was like a bright driving summer rain, and over to a group of people clustered bes beside a decrepit lorry. They were our relatives, most of them from St. Andrews, although Dada herself lived in St. Thomas. The women wearing bright print dresses, the colors vivid against their darkness. The men rusty black suits that encased them like straight jackets. Dado, holding fast to my hand, became my anchor as they circled round us like a nervous sea, exclaiming, touching us with their calloused hands, embracing us shyly. They laughed in awed bursts. But look, Audrey got big, big children. And see the nice things they're wearing, wrist watch and all. I tell you, Audrey has done all right for herself in New York. Dado, ashamed at their wonder, embarrassed for them, admonished them the while. But oh Christ, she said, why you all got to get on like you never saw people from away, people from away before? You would think New York is the only place in the world to hear one of. That's why I don't like to go any place with you St. Andrews people. You know, you all ain't been colonized. 
we were in the back of the lorry finally, packed in among the barrels of ham, flour, cornmeal, and rice, and the trunks of clothes that my mother had brought as gifts. We made our way slowly through Bridgetown, Bridge, Bridgetown's clogged streets, part of a funeral procession of cars and open-sided buses, bicycles and donkey carts. The dim little limestone shops and offices along the way marched with us at the same mournful pace towards the same grave ceremony. As did the people, the women balancing huge baskets on top of their heads, as if they were no more than hats they wore to shade them from the sun. Looking over the edge of the lorry, I watched as their feet slurred the dust. I listened and their voices, raw and loud and dissonant in the heat, seemed to be grappling with each other high overhead. Stay tuned for part two. Part two. Dadu sat on a trunk in our midst, a monarch amid her court. She still held my hand, but it was different now. I had suddenly become her anchor, for I felt her fear of the lorry with its asthmatic motor, a fear and distrust, I later learned she held of all machines, beating like a pulse in her rough palm. As soon as we left Bridgetown behind though, she relaxed, and while the others around us talked, she gazed at the cane standing tall on either side of the winding mall road. See there, she said softly to herself, after a time, the canes this side are pretty enough. They were too much for me. I thought of them as giant weeds that had overrun the island, leaving scarcely any room for the small tottering houses of sun-bleached pine we passed or the people, dark streaks as our lorry hurtled by. I suddenly feared that we were journeying, unaware that we were, towards some dangerous place where the canes grown as high and thick as a forest would close in on us and run us through with their stiletto blades. I longed then for the familiar, for the street in Brooklyn where I lived, for my father who had refused to accompany us, blowing out good money on foolishness he had set off the trip, for a game of tag with my friends under the chestnut tree outside our aging brownstone ho house. Yes. But wait till you see Thomas Keynes, Dad was saying to me. Their Keynes father, Bo, she gave a proud, arrogant nod. Tomorrow, God willing, I go and take you out in the ground and show them to you. True to her word, Dad took me with her the following day out into the ground. It was a fairly large plot adjoining her weathered board shingle house and consisting of a small orchard, a good-sized cane piece, and behind the canes, where the land sloped abruptly down, a gully. She had purchased it with Panama money sent her by her eldest son, my Uncle Joseph, who had died working on the canal. We entered the ground along a trail no wider than her body, and as devious and complex as her reasons for showing me her land. Dad strode briskly ahead, her slight form filled out this morning by the layers of sacking petticoats she wore under her working dress to protect her against the damp. A fresh white cloth elaborately arranged around her head added to her height and lent her a vain, almost roughish air. Her pace slowed once we reached the orchard, and glancing back at me occasionally over her shoulder, she pointed out the various trees. This here is a breadfruit, she said. That one yonder is Papa. 
Here is a guava. This is a mango. I know you don't have anything like these in New York. Here is a sugar apple. The fruit looked more like artichokes than apples to me. This one bears limes. She went on for some time, intoning the names of the trees as though they were, they were those of gods. Finally, turning to me, she said, I know you don't have anything this nice where you come from. Then, as I hesitated, I said, I know you don't have anything anything this nice where you come from no i said and my world did seem suddenly lacking dad nodded and passed on the orchard ended and we were on the narrow cart road that led through the cane piece the canes clashing like swords above my cowering head again she turned and her thin muscular arms spread wide her dim gaze embracing the small field of canes. She said, and her voice almost broke under the weight of her pride, Tell me, have you got anything like these in that place where you were born? No. I didn't think so. I bet you don't even know that these canes here and the sugar you eat is, is one and the same thing. That they just throw the canes into some damn machine at that f at the factory and squeeze out all the little life in them to make sugar for you also in New York to eat. I bet you don't know that. I've got two cavities and I'm not allowed to eat a lot of sugar. But dad didn't hear me. She had turned with an inexplicably angry motion and was making her way rapidly out of the canes and down the slope at the edge of the field which led to the gully below following her apprehensively down the incline amid a, stra a stand of banana plants whose leaves flapped like elephants ears in the wind i found myself in the middle of a small tropical wood a place dense and damp and gloomy and tremulous with the fitful play of light and shadow as the leaves high above moved against the sun that was almost hidden from view. It was a violent place that tangled foliage fighting each other for a chance at the sunlight. The branches of the trees locked in what seemed like an immemorial struggle, one both necessary and inevitable. But despite the violence, it was pleasant, almost peaceful in the gully, and beneath the thick undergrowth, the earth smelled like spring. This time, Dadu didn't even bother to ask her usual question, but simply turned and waited for me to speak. No, I said, my head bowed. We don't have anything like this in New York. Ah, she cried, her triumph complete. I didn't think so. Why, I've heard that's a place where you can walk till you're near a drop and never see a tree. We've got a chestnut, a chestnut tree in front of our house, I said. Does it bear? She waited. I ask you, does it bear? beer not anymore i muttered it used to but not anymore she gave the nod that was like a nervous twitch you see she said nothing can bear there then secure behind her scorn she added but tell me what's this snow light that you hear so much about looking up i studied her closely sensing my chance and then i told her describing at length and with as much drama as i could summon not only what snow in the city was like but what it would be like here in her perennial summer kingdom and you see all these trees you got here i said well they'd be bare no leaves no fruit nothing they'd be covered in snow you see your canes? They'd be buried under tons of snow. 
The snow would be higher than your head, higher than your house, and you wouldn't be able to come down into this here gully because it would be was snowed under. She searched my face for the lie. Still scornful, but intrigued. What a thing, <laughs> she said finally, whispering it softly to herself. And when it snows, you couldn't dress like you are now, I said. Oh no, you'd freeze to death. You'd have to wear a hat and gloves and galoshes and earmuffs so your ears wouldn't freeze and drop off. And a heavy coat. I've got a Shirley Temple coat with fur on the collar. I can dance. You want to see? Before she could answer, I began. And with a dance called the truck, which was popular back then in the 1930s. My right forefinger waving. I trucked around the nearby trees and around Dadu's odd and rigid form. After the truck, I did the Suzy Q, my lean hip swishing, my sneakers sidling, zigzag around over the ground. I can sing. I said and did so, starting with I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter, then without pausing, T for two, and ending with I found a million dollar baby in a five and ten cent store. For long moments afterwards, Dado stared at me as if I were a creature from Mars, an emissary from some world she did not know, but which intrigued her and whose power she both felt and feared. Yet something about my performance must have pleased her because bending down, she slowly lifted her long skirt and then one by one, the layers of petticoats until she came to a drawstring purse dangling at the end of a long strip of cloth tied round her waist. Opening the purse, she handed me a penny. Here, she said, half smiling, against her will take this to buy yourself a suite at the shop up the road there's nothing to be done with you soul <laughs> from then on whenever i wasn't taken to visit relatives i accompanied dad out into the ground and alone with her amid the canes or down in the gully i told her about new york it always began with some slighting remark on her part i know they don't have anything this nice where you come from or Tell me, I hear those foolish people in New York does do such and such. But as I answered, recreating my towering world of steel and concrete and machines for her, building the city out of words, I would feel her give way. I came to know the signs of her surrender. The total stiffness that would come over her little hard, dry form. The probing gaze that like a surgeon's knife, sought to cut through my skull to get at the images there, to see if I were lying. Above all, her fear, a fear nameless and profound, the same one I had felt beating in the palm of her hand that day in the lorry. Over the weeks, I told her about refrigerators, radios, gas stoves, elevators, trolley cars, ring washing machines, Movies, airplanes, the cyclone at Coney Island, subways, toasters, electric lights. At night, see, all you have to do is flip this little switch on the wall and all the lights in the house go on, just like that, like magic. It's like turning on the sun at night. But tell me, she said to me once with a faint mocking smile, do the white people have all these things too? Or is only the people looking like us? I laughed. What do you mean? I said. The white people have even better. Then, I beat up a white girl in my class last term. Beating up white people? Her tone was incredulous. How you mean? I said, using an expression of hers. She called me a name. For some reason, Dad could not quite get over this and repeated the same hushed, shocked voice. Beating up white people now. Oh, Lord. 
The world's changing up so I can scarce recognize it anymore. One morning toward the end of our stay, Dadu led me into a part of the gully that we had never visited before, an area darker, more thickly amid the dense bush. Sorry, an area darker and more thickly overgrown than the rest, almost impenetrable. There in a small clearing, which rose cleanly out of the ground and drawing the eye up with it, soared high above the trees around it into the sky. It appeared to be touching the blue dome of sky, to be flaunting its dark crowns of fronds right in the blinding white face of the late morning, of the late morning sun. Dad watched me a long time before she spoke. And then she said very quietly, All right, now, tell me if you've got anything this tall in that place you're from. I almost wished seeing her face that I could have said no. Yes, I said, we've got buildings hundreds of times this tall in New York. There's one called the Empire State Building. That's the tallest in the world. My class visited it last year and I went all the way up to the top. It's got over a hundred floors. I can't describe how tall it is. Wait a minute. What's the name of that hill I went to visit the other day where they have the police station? You mean B6? Yes, B6. Well, the Empire State Building is way taller than that. You're lying now, she shouted, trembling with rage. Her hand lifted to strike me. No, I'm not, I said. It really is. If you don't believe me, I'll send you a picture postcard of it as soon as... No, I'm not, I said. It really is. If you don't believe me, I'll send you a picture postcard of it soon as I get back home so you can see for yourself. But it's way taller than B6. All the fight went out of her at that. The hand poised to strike me fell limp to her side. And she, as she, and as she stared at me, seeing not me, but the building that was taller than the highest hill she knew, the small stubborn light in her eyes, it was the same amber as the flame in the kerosene lamp she lit at dusk began to fail. Finally, with a vague gesture that even in the midst of her defeat still tried to dismiss me and my world, she turned and started back through the gully, walking slowly, her steps groping and uncertain, as if she was suddenly no longer sure of the way, while I followed triumphant, yet strangely saddened behind the next morning, I found her dressed for our morning walk, but stretched out on the Burby's chair in the tiny drawing room where she sometimes napped during the afternoon heat. Her face turned to the window beside her. She appeared thinner and suddenly indescribably old. My dadu, I said. Yes, no, she said. Her voice was listless and her face and the face she slowly turned my way. Now that I think back on it, like a Benin mask, the features drawn and almost distorted by an ancient abstract sorrow. Don't you feel well? I asked. Girl, I don't know. My dado, I go and boil you some bush tea. My aunt, dado's youngest child who lived with her, called from the shed roof kitchen. Who tell you I need bush tea? She cried, her voice assuming for a moment its old authority. You can't even rest nowadays without some malicious person looking for you to be dead. Come girl. She motioned me to a place beside her on the old fashioned lounge chair. Give us a tune. I sang for her until breakfast at 11. All my brash, irreverent Tin Pan Alley songs. And then, just before noon, we went out into the ground, 
but it was a short, dispirited walk. Dad didn't even notice that the mangoes were beginning to ripen and would have to be picked before the village boys got to them. And then she paused occasionally and looked out across the canes or up at her trees. It wasn't as if she were seeing them, but something else. Some huge monolithic shape had imposed itself, it seemed, between her and the land, obstructing her vision. Returning to the house, she slept the entire afternoon on the Burbis chair. She remained like this until we left, languishing away the mornings on the chair at the window gazing out at the land, as if it were already doomed. Then, at noon, taking the brief stroll with me through the ground during which she, she seldom spoke, and afterwards returning home to sleep till almost dusk sometimes. On the day of our departure, she put on the austere ankle-length white dress, the black shoes and brown felt hat, her town clothes she called them. But she did not go out, she did not go with us to town. She saw us off on the road outside her house, and in the midst of my mother's tearful protracted farewell, she leaned down and whispered in my ear, Girl, you're not to forget now to send me the picture of that building you hear. By the time I mailed her the large colored picture postcard of the Empire State Building, she was dead. She died during the famous 37 strike, which began shortly after we left. On the day of her death, England sent planes flying low over the island in a show of force. So low, according to my aunt's letter, that the downdraft from them shook the ripened mangoes from the trees in Dado's orchard. Frightened, everyone in the village fled into the canes, except Dado. She remained in the house at the window. So my aunt said, watching as the planes came swooping and screaming like monstrous birds down over the village, over her house, rattling her trees and flattening the young canes in her field. It must have seemed to her lying there that they did not intend pulling out of their, of their dive. But like the hardback beetles which hurled themselves with suicidal force against the walls of the house at night, those menacing silver shapes would hurl themselves in an ecstasy of self-immolation onto the land, destroying it utterly. When the planes finally left and the villagers returned, they found her dead on the Burby's chair at the window. She died and I lived, but always to this day, even within the shadow of her death. For a brief period after I was grown, I went to live alone, like one doing penance, in a loft above a noisy factory in downtown New York, and there painted seas of sugarcane and huge swirling Van Gogh suns and palm trees, striding like brightly plumbed Watusi across this tropical landscape while the thunderous tread of the machines downstairs jarred the floor beneath my easel, mocking my efforts. To that in memoriam is really, um, it's a sad story, but at the end of it, we realize that our narrator, she's paying homage to her grandmother, as the title suggests, you know, in memoriam, in memory of uh, my dado. And that's what our narrator is doing. So what I'm going to be doing for you now is just to give you a brief summary of the story, as well as give you the setting of the story, um, some narrative techniques that are used in the story as well. All right, so our story is set in Barbados and New York and the disembarkation shed where the, the narrator and her family met Dado after they came off of the boat that led them away from the ship. Now, Dado is a woman of 80 odd years who had a face that looked like a death mask, but had eyes that were on the contrary, full of spirit. So even though Dado looked um, to the nine year old, the, the narrator when she was nine years old, she looked like she had on a death mask. 
her eyes were full of spirit. And we saw that spirit in Dado when she kept saying to the narrator, I bet you don't have anything like this in New York. Um, to which the narrator had always responded, except for that one time, had always responded that, no, I don't have anything that like what you have in this beautiful place um, in Barbados. The narrator, along with her sister and her mother, went to Barbados to visit her grandmother, Dado. Uh, the meeting between the grandmother and the narrator becomes a battle between age and youth, um, technology and nature. And we saw that playing out in the the narration by our, or no, adult uh, narrator. We look at the conflict in the story. The story's conflict is... Um, <clears throat> We see that as Dado's unwillingness to accept change, uh, she does not want to acknowledge that there is a world outside of St. Thomas Barbados. And we see that with her little competition with her granddaughter. There's also a clash between her world and the granddaughter's world. Um, the visit of the narrator brings or helps Dado in a sense to recognize that things and times have changed, but ultimately her fear of technology kills her. The granddaughter blames herself and carries that guilt into adulthood. As we saw at the end of the story when she says, you know, for a time she went to live by herself over a noisy train station and she painted uh, landscapes um, in the memory of her grandmother. That's how guilty she felt into adulthood because she thought that had she known then that her telling her grandmother that there were buildings taller than that royal palm tree had she known that that would have been um the cause for just this the life um draining from her grandmother she would have she wouldn't have said yes she would have said no but she was nine years old she didn't know any better uh some themes in our short story to dad in memoriam we look at love and family relationships so we can explore that theme uh the familial ties everybody came to the the, the disembarkation shed to to see um audrey and the the two grandchildren um we realize that dado has a little thing about her where she may not have wanted audrey to leave barbados to to make a better life for herself but it wasn't a matter of not making a better life for herself so to speak it was just that audrey left and dad was saying you know you you've leave, you've left this beautiful country for a concrete jungle um but at the same time audrey still respects her mother and we see this respect or fear for you know um a senior citizen <laughs> if you want to call dad with that you know we see this respect or fear or just that audrey understood her mother and she looked for her mother's approval with whatever she did based on how the narrator described um the the meeting the role of the elderly is another theme that we can look at dado is presented as the head of her family and is accorded with the respect that is given to the family's matriarch we look at change the fact that dado did not want to accept uh change um re-technology and she was afraid to embrace her granddaughter's um her granddaughter's reality we look at race as another theme where dad was surprised that the narrator said hey i beat up a white girl i beat her up she called me a name and i didn't like it so i beat her up dad was like oh look at these things now we're going out there beating up white people so we look at that as um an issue with the race that with the race that dad is very surprised and exclaims that the world has changed a lot and that she can no longer recognize it dad still saw the whites as being superior and even the thought of her granddaughter fighting a white girl was a lot for her and we also recognize that when the, 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 the cousins were greeting um, Audrey and her children, the narrator and her pair, her mother and her sister. Dad said, you are behaving like you're not colonized. <clears throat> we look at nature as another theme in our story, you know, places. Nature, um, we see where Dado is very proud of where she's from, from St. Thomas Barbados. She's extremely proud of the cane fields, the mango trees, the orange, everything that is there. She is extremely proud of it. And so she boasts um, to the granddaughter just by showing her, like she's saying, and she does say, do you don't have anything like this in New York? 
she wasn't asking her um as a matter of oh you need to respond to this she's like jeering her granddaughter like you don't have all of these beautiful trees um in new york and when the granddaughter says yes we have one she's like but does it bear you know so dad was like saying at the end of the day you may have trees but they don't bear you can't compare um your concrete jungle to what we have here in St. Thomas Barbados. There's just no comparison to that. All right. So we're going to look at some narrative techniques now in our story. We look at symbolism. The Empire State Building is a symbol of technology, power, and progress. We look at the royal palm tree. And this is a symbol of what nature can be without the interference of mankind. Um, <clears throat> We look at the paintings that the granddaughter um was drawing in her adulthood uh when she said that she lived alone you know um and she was painting these landscapes we look at those paintings as another example of symbol um symbolism in our story so Dado's granddaughter believes that she is to be blamed for killing her grandmother because she defeated her and broke her spirit. It was more than likely the fright of witnessing the planes or machines and old age that took a toll on Dado. But even as an adult, this guilt remains. And so the paintings, um, and so she paints, sorry, Caribbean landscapes as a tribute to her Dado, while the machines below mock her and the machines below the factory, um, the trains, etc. Now we look at the contrast in the stories that so many examples of contrast in the story but we look at dadu and her granddaughter this nine-year-old a child in a sense these two children or these sorry these two characters are symbols of their very different world so they contrast each other so much dadu is from saint thomas barbados beautiful landscape nature at its finest and the granddaughter from a concrete jungle in new york where the trees don't bear where you have snow where snow kills everything um like that there is also evidence of contrast in the setting um that they live in as i said earlier and we have the fierceness of spirit um within the granddaughter and the andado foreshadowing is another technique that we look at in this uh story and it can be said that dado's response to the knowledge of the existence of the empire state building which um we look at as her defeat is a foreshadowing of her death she was so saddened her spirited conversation that she used to have with her granddaughter was no longer there um when when her granddaughter said yes the empire state building is way taller than the tallest hill that you know and so this could have been an um a foreshadowing of her death her actual death when she just stopped when she started to just lay about every day um by her window another narrative technique that we look at in this story is irony um the child is surprised to find that her mother is afraid of dado and the child is saying but you are this stoic person that i'm afraid of and to see you being afraid of your own mother i'm like hold on what's going on here so it's ironic to the child that this is happening that mom you're so strict so that's what the child is thinking the narrator you're so strict i'm really afraid of you but when i see you being afraid of your mother it's it's a very ironic situation um another example of irony is that dado also grows to love her granddaughter even though she prefers boys and light skin tones um another example of irony in the story that we could look at um the setting the natural landscape that the granddaughter rejected as a child becomes the focus of her artwork when she is an adult um we have to look at the flashback technique as well that the narrator is telling us this story um when she's an adult and so she can look back and say you know if i had known all of this that all of this would have happened i would not have been um so quick to say yes i have something better than that um in in new york uh thank you so very much for joining us today 
um, continue to read these short stories. Remember that you are comparing and contrasting these uh, stories. If it is that you will be uh, doing the, the, sh the short stories in the pro section of your exam.